the internet. I'm Christopher Peterson. You're listening to Nerd EXP Cinecast. This week I'm hanging out with Guillermo. I am also here. Drew. Hi, Hello. Wow, that was automatic. <laughs> and Edgar. Hello, good to be here. In space. <laughs> <laughs> where, no, where no one can hear you podcast. <laughs> uh, if this is your first time, you're in for a treat. If you're coming back, thanks. We appreciate it. Each week, we go through the top entertainment headlines and help you level up your movie IQ. Jumping straight into our news, X-Men Apocalypse Photos came out. Uh, this is... Oh boy. <laughs> entertainment Week, we did a spread. Uh, we had some pictures of Psylocke, Storm, Apocalypse, Jean Grey, Jubilee, Cyclops. Uh, did you say Cyclops twice? Jean Grey, Jubilee, Cyclops. Uh, Cyclops is so important. No, uh, so we get these photos that come out. Apocalypse looks like shit. Uh, there's just no other way to say it. Um, Olivia Munn... Oh, he looks like ooze. <laughs> he, he, he looks like Ivan Ooze, uh, which is my first thought when I saw it from the Power Rangers movie, which I thought was an original thought. Then I went on Twitter and Tumblr, and everybody thought the same thing. Um, Maybe it's the same costume designer. <laughs> Maybe they're using the same one. So, what are your guys' thoughts? Let's focus on Apocalypse. Let's focus okay. on the worst first. What are your thoughts on Apocalypse, Edgar? Uh, I really like the um, the Psylocke costume. Olivia Munn looks great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, Apocalypse is whatever. It's like, you'll just grow into it. I, guess. I, I give this... Uh, in a the comic, movie. he's supposed to grow, isn't he? Like, he's supposed to, like, turn his belt? No, 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 that's Ant-Man. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I know in the comics, like, Apocalypse can grow bigger. Like, yeah. the size, he can get bigger, right? You're absolutely right. He does grow bigger. Uh, but he's always muscular. Like, he doesn't start off, like, scrawny and weird-looking. Well, he's not scrawny. He had muscles. Yeah, but I mean, all right, so let's, let's start but it. But he doesn't Perfect. look like Apocalypse. So at the end of uh, Days of Future Past, we see Apocalypse, right? Sure. And he's and really he's, scrawny. He's a really scrawny young mm-hmm. mutant. And then this time, and he's blue. He's definitely blue. He was gray. He was gray. He was gray. He was blue, gray. <laughs> at that point, and gray then blue. the first blue pictures gray. that they showed. Well, let, let, let's recap. Oscar Isaac is uh, playing uh, Apocalypse. So they pick a character actor uh, to to bring this guy to or this villain to life. And then they, we see the picture one. It looks nothing like the one we saw in, 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 in Days of Future Past, to me at least. Two, it doesn't look like Oscar Isaacs at all. I get that. And yeah. three, you guys already brought out the point that it, it's a purple live news again. And it doesn't look like the uh, San Diego Comic Con poster, which we praised as being yeah. good character design true. last week. Very true. All I right. didn't even think about that. So do we give this the benefit of the doubt that this is just one picture at one angle with some light? Yes. And maybe there will be different costumes? Only because of Entertainment Weekly's cover, he looks more blue and looks a little bit better. Okay. But just, he still looks bad. Yeah. But like marginally better. Um, maybe he has different... Different like Maybe he has different stages of his costume. It's possible. Like we'll see a bigger maybe. one. Maybe he'll pull a fruit and have, like, different uh, phases. Yeah. Uh, you brought up Olivia Munn's Psylocke. I think Olivia Munn looks great in the Psylocke costume. I think for a movie, and I think, like, maybe just like, that shot that they showed, it's too comic booky. You don't, like, it is a one-for-one recreation of what she wears in the comic books. Yeah, but so is Jubilee. And, yeah, but Jubilee just wears a yellow trench coat. And she's a, I mean, I, I think they, they're going for that. That's what they're going for 100%. I don't know. I mean, like, they did it with the others. They had the black leather or the black and yellow. They never, like, put them exactly in their movie. But they can like, get, get away, they can get away with the it 80s. this time because it's the 80s. It's the 80s. Which is where I was going. Yes. It's colorful. I, I think they're going for exactly that. Everything we saw in the, in the uh, 90s cartoons, they're going for that, those outfits. If Wolverine shows up in this movie, which I'm sure he will... He might wear the spandex, the yellow and black spandex. I don't know about that. Oh, he will wear that. They have to. He'll just show up with jeans and a ripped white beater. Nope, nope, nope. I think he's going to show up with a costume. Even the, it might be the brown costume for all we know. 
But uh, I, I think Wolverine shows up with a costume. So, uh, with Adam and Pete? Sure. I hope so. <laughs> okay. I fucking hate those bone claws. I uh, hope so. And then Storm's in there with her freaking mohawk, which, whatever. I mean, she had in the comics, I don't know exactly, but like 10 issues, but somehow it's like a cultural phenomenon. Like, that's something that she's had forever. Um, so. That would be good. I mean, I guess this is the first time we're seeing stuff. Um, there's a trailer out there that Fox showed at Comic Con, which you know there's they're they're supposed to release in two weeks the uh, trailer that they showed for Deadpool. I don't, you know, once they release the one for Deadpool, I'm sure the X Men trailer won't be too far behind, and uh, hopefully we'll get to see this costumes in action. I'm sure you know the exact. Um, you know, the, the, the scenes where the pictures were extracted from, I'm sure that's what the, probably the preview will show. And you bring up a great point, uh, and, and I had the same problem with Ghostbusters. There is a difference between seeing still pictures and seeing this as a movie, and seeing this in the scene. Because these are meant to be seen in motion and, you know, not a wallpaper. Sad so. Batman. I mean, <laughs> Sad Batman is a prime example. The costume look just playing uh, in those pictures but now that we got, actually got to see it in motion uh, Wonder Woman is another prime example I mean I've been a huge huge critic of the Wonder Woman costume but after I saw it in that trailer it looks great the colors you know look dead on as, as I expected so did right. everyone here read that the Suicide Squad trailer is being watched more than the Batman vs Superman trailer I did see that I did see that. Does no it way. surprise you? Way. I mean, we kind of called Suicide Squad a winner last week over Batman v Superman. Okay, so let's break this down. It's being watched more than the Batman v Superman trailer from Comic Con. Is it being watched more than the first Batman v Superman trailer? I don't know. I didn't say. Because that, I mean, like, it is, that was Batman's apples apples second trailer. So people have already kind of seen some of it. Some people don't want to see any more. Some people already saw enough and, you know... I guess it makes sense. Suicide Squad is, is something newer. Uh, people are more likely to, to want to test it out over the Batman vs. Superman. It's a good point, but I, I, I mean... I, I, it's it, still shocking. Yeah, it's still a you know, big piece of news that it is beating it. I mean, But not more than the Star Wars trailer. This is a, Exactly. This is a movie, or, or the Futurette as a matter of fact. Uh, this is a movie that comes out next year, right? Yeah, next April. March. Uh, March. What are we talking about? Uh, Batman, Batman Superman. yes. Superman's March. March. And yep. then Suicide Squad, Squad is at the end of summer? August. Yeah, yeah. August. August. So, that, that's kind of troubling. That, you know, they're already getting more... I don't know. We'll, we'll see with that universe. Who, who knows? I mean, this is one universe that still has to prove themselves in the first... You know, if Batman v Superman does terribly, I don't think that, that Suicide Squad has the power to redeem them. No, you're absolutely right, because Batman v Superman is bleeding into Justice League, it's setting up Wonder Woman, it's setting up uh, Aquaman, potentially setting up Cyborg, even potentially setting up Flash, like, I keep hearing rumors that he's still going to be in that movie, so I mean, like, if if Batman v Superman Dawn Justice does poorly, but then Suicide Squad does well, I mean, maybe they can try and refocus, but they don't have a bunch of spin-off movies coming from Suicide Squad like they do Batman v Superman, so that's more... Totally, what we would expect would, from that universe. Which brings another point that I, I guess. So throughout the weekend, I went to the movies, and of course, our topic of the week is going to be Ant Man. But another movie that came out uh, along with this weekend was Trainwreck. In Trainwreck, Ezra Miller, who is the, you know, who is supposed to be portraying the next Flash in the DC cinematic universe, he's in this movie. He plays an interesting character, but man, I was. I, you know, I, I, I was, uh, what's the, the, the right, to, I was taken very aback by the, the, by the thought that that guy is going to be playing Flash. Um, you know, every time we see, I mean, we saw it in Ant-Man, and we'll touch on it, the casting is just dead on every time. This time around, I'm having my doubts with DC, I mean, the guy who they picked to be the Flash, it's, it's troubling. Can't be worse than Lex Luthor. <sighs> I can't. 
Lex Luthor, I mean, you see what they're going for, but if they're going that way with the Flash, it's just interesting. I mean, if you guys are not familiar with the actor, definitely... Uh, the only move full-length feature that I've seen him on is the uh, the Purse of Being a Wallflower, and the character that he plays in the Purse of Being a Wallflower, it's pretty close to what he plays in uh, Trainwreck. So you got a serious movie and a comedy movie. It looks like this guy is a very one-dimensional actor. I'm afraid for that superhero movie. Very afraid. There's a whole section called what we've been watching. Like yeah, way that. I, I was just tying it in, <laughs> tying it in to get my thoughts about the DC. I wonder if he'll dye his hair. So those are our thoughts on the apocalypse photos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on, uh, Pacific Rim, according to uh, Global News, is filming in Pinewood, Toronto, and the movie is going to be called Pacific Rim. Maelstrom. 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 Uh, we're looking at a August 2017 release. So, I mean, filming, shooting, I mean, that seems on target. Uh, I, I think Pacific Rim was a one and done. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the Maelstrom will do better. But so they're really trying to set up that monster for Yeah, that's, that's where I was going for. So, uh, keep in mind, uh, this yeah. is Legendary Studios, who also was the producing company behind the Ju- New Jurassic Park. It's also the same uh, producing company behind the uh, Skull Island uh, King Kong movie that's coming out. And Godzilla. And Godzilla that came out. So it's been long rumored that they want it to be a Monsters franchise. So, Is it still Guillermo del Toro? Yes. It is uh, Guillermo oh. del Toro coming back. Um, something he had said, or I saw an interview or excerpts from an interview with Guillermo del Toro where he said he was offered you know somewhat of an involvement with the Star Wars universe as a matter of fact but he had to choose between keeping Pacific Rim alive or going to explore the Star Wars side and it looks like with the news today like he didn't say one which way he had chosen or which way he was going but he said that he had those options and with this news I guess he Decided to. He didn't stay want to pull a Brian Singer. Yeah. Well, Catch my druid. <laughs> I mean, like Pacific Rim is kind of like his baby. Like he made that. Uh, so I mean, like this is him playing with his own intellectual property instead yeah. of playing with somebody else's toys. And, I mean, with all the Star Wars anthology films they're going to be making, he can come in later. And, and I mean, <laughs> exactly with, with with all these directors, though. I mean, uh, I can't remember the uh, lady who directed Glory, uh, Oscar nominated. Glory? Was, uh, Glory? No, uh... The slave movie from... Not Glory. Yeah. <laughs> Denzel uh, Washington? No, the, uh... Glory? Martin Luther King movie that was out, nominated this past Selma. year. Selma. Selma. Selma, I'm sorry, guys. Selma. Selma. Uh, she was the director that was rumored to be, um... Doing Black doing Panther. Black Panther. She turned that down. And she turned it down, and then she just did an interview this past week talking about a little bit of why she turned it down, and she said... You know, I didn't want it to be tied down to doing this for the next so many years, three years, I think is the, the number she threw out there, working on somebody else's intellectual property. For So a lot of directors are turning, turning this down because of that. So, I mean, props to them for keep wanting to be original. But Which I imagine has to be a very political uh, PR statement. Because, I mean, we've heard from Whedon and Wright and Fabio and everybody else that Marvel is a pain in the ass to work for. So, and I mean, when you watch those movies, I mean, there, there is that consistent tone and feel. And I mean, that probably is with Kevin Feige breathing down your neck as a director telling you what to do and what to edit and what to cut. So, yeah. I mean, if it was Marvel Phase 1, it would be a whole different story. But I mean, they're so far into their own web that at this point, I, I agree. They have to have the, the director, I wouldn't say it wouldn't matter, but that director has less vision now that they did in phase one and phase two. Phase three, it's just execute. Here's the plan, go make the movie. Uh, so, uh, and the lady's name is Ava DuVernay, uh, for all you knowers out there. Uh, and those are our thoughts on <laughs> Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim. <laughs> yes. But, oh, no but, but same, oh my god. <laughs> but same with uh, Marvel. Uh, looks like we have the next writers for the Marvel slash Sony uh, Spider-Man reboot. Okay. Uh, John uh, Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein. 
You might not necessarily recognize their names, but they did uh, Horrible Bosses, Claudia with a Chance of Meatballs 2. Um, so, I mean, mostly comedies. Yeah. Well, and Vacation, right? The upcoming Vacation movie? An upcoming Vacation. Awesome. The incredible Burt Wonderstone. Ooh. Oof. Well, Ooh. I'll be honest. I only like Claudia with a Chance of Meatballs 2 out of that grouping. Even that I was known for. It was so Even weak that, compared to the first yeah, one. Yeah, that's, that's always been the case. Um, interesting. I, I guess it, it's, it's, it, this is green writing. So we'll but it's a Marvel it. Studios production, so... Well, it's a Sony production. Sony production yeah, with Marvel, Marvel Studios, Studios co-production. Yeah. Sony is distributing. Yes. Marvel Studios is producing. Correct. And Kevin Feige is executive producer on this thing. So... It's a Marvel. Writers movie. might not. It's a Marvel. Movie. Like we're saying about directors, writers might not matter as much as normal. At this point, yeah, you might be right, but it's interesting with the tone. They're that being handed a story, basically. So, those writers. I mean, those writers. Right. The tone that they set by selecting those writers is they're going for definitely a child, uh, child's version of Spider-Man. So uh, this is like if you were in school. And the teacher gives you top work done, like a rubric, and then you fill in your own. That's what Marvel feels like. Mad Libs? <laughs> yeah, like Mad Libs, exactly. So, the, so Kevin Feige gives you his, like, um, uh, oh, what's that? Like his, I mean, no, <laughs> like, like his bullet point. Uh, yeah, he it's tells you me, like the story videos, and, and then someone else has to fill in the rest of it. I got gotcha. you. Now, I mean, I think you're onto something. Uh, but Spider-Man is supposed to be funny, and yes, uh, we saw him more wisecracking in the amazing version, and a little bit more glib and talking. But he's never kind of been funny, like mm-hmm. actually, like amusing in his uh, movie versions. I, th- I thought uh, Andrew Garfield did okay as being witty, at least. I think he delivered the lines that were written. I think he delivered the lines that were written well, but I don't think like they were funny. Like I don't think like he had a funny script. I don't remember ever laughing at what Spider-Man said. With the first no. Amazing Spider-Man, yes, he did. I think. I mean, I when I saw First Amazing Spider-Man, I thought they did a very good job for capturing that Peter Parker. Sure, I, I agree. Yeah. Like, Funny, I mean, from what we had seen before with uh, with Toby Maguire, at least. So, no. Drew, any thoughts? No. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, moving on, uh, Disney news. Sword in the Stone <laughs> is going to be the next uh, live action remake. I apologize. Reimagining. Reimagining is the way. Now, none of this is it's official, but there's been a lot of rumors with Disney. And rightfully so, with their D23 coming up in a couple of weeks. So uh, uh, mid-August, D23 uh, convention, it's the uh, Disney convention. Just like Comic-Con was for the comic universe, this is Disney 100% based out of Anaheim's Convention Center, which is, you know, steps away from, uh, from, uh, from, or from, from Disneyland. So... Um, They've been announcing more events to the program, and one of the events that they announced, which is uh, Friday's, on Friday's schedule, is Disney's films. Uh, and they're going to do animated films in the morning, and in the afternoon is live action films that are Disney Studios. Um, so far, the only ones that we knew about was the... Uh, um, Alice in Wonderland sequel. Alice in Wonderland sequel, and... The Jungle Book? The Jungle Book, right. Those were the only two that have been 100% confirmed. Oh, for D23. That Disney Studios has confirmed as live action. But Wait, then, so you mean when we said Dumbo, Winnie the Pooh, Tinkerbell, we've, those are all rumors? No, those are not rumors, but they are not haven't been officially announced by Disney. Like, Disney hasn't said, like, yep, this is people, but ah. it's pretty confirmed no, by the studio. No, it's not Facebook. It. Not yet. Right. <laughs> so I think in this, you know, in this kind of setting, it would not surprise me if they bring bring you know, uh, John Favreau in. They bring uh, Reese Witherspoon. John Favreau doing the jump book. Yeah, they bring Reese Witherspoon. They bring whoever's going to be doing this uh, 
reimagining. Um, so the only thing I have right now is a writer. Uh, the writer is, I apologize, uh, Brian Cogman. He's written Game of Thrones. Yes. Okay. It'll be interesting. Uh, that movie, I, it seems that Disney for a while had stayed away from that movie. And this is just a little bit of, I guess, Disney useless knowledge. Disney had always stayed away from that story, from re- revisiting that story and releasing that story again. Because it's one of those that whenever they made it, they felt like everybody else went and made the same movie with the King Arthur story and Merlin. So those were characters where Disney's marketing actually felt like they couldn't capitalize. When people think of Merlin, they're not thinking of the sword and the stone Merlin. You know, when they think Arthur, they're not thinking that. Yeah. So the marketing, like people, you know, that wants to sell stuff, they didn't care for that at all. You know, you rarely see that storyline included in anything in the theme parks or the shows or anything for that matter. So it's interesting that they have that. Uh, the Sword in the Stone is based off of one of my personal favorite books, which is the One Two Future King by T. H. White. So I have a soft spot in the Sword in the Stone. Just watching like the One Two Future King come to life. So maybe they'll base the book more than the last film. Have you guys watched Sword in the Stone lately? Like that movie just that movie just ends. I think it's like uh, and done. I haven't seen it since. Long live the king. So yeah, um, we'll see. We'll see where they go with it. But I think, like I said, prepared out of D twenty three. There's gonna. I, I I would not be surprised if Disney's afternoon panels like let's bring everybody that's got a movie for the next five years and here's our Disney universe. And at some point, we're going to make, you know, maybe blend the lands. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's where they were going. Ugh. I don't know why. I thought these were more concrete when we were talking about them. I didn't realize they were still, like, yeah. concepts and not no, actually. No, like, but no see, press releases. Yeah. No <laughs> press release. Like, Disney has not officially made it, but you got, you We've know, been talking. Like, people have been talking about yeah, their Yeah, absolutely. Facts. Absolutely. Like, so at this point, I think they're happening. Yeah. I mean, you got, risk, you know, p- big people, big names involved with these movies already. Sure. And no one's come out and said, no, you guys are full of it. We're denying it for yeah. that reason. I think they're the just waiting. Disney for. movie that we read is in the works. Uh, we have Genies, which is going to be an Aladdin prequel. Uh, which Pinocchio. Be- well, the big buzz this week was exactly what you talked about, Chris, which is the... Uh, uh, Aladdin. They're they're also reimagining or revisiting the Aladdin uh, storyline with what appears to be a prequel to the Aladdin storyline, where the genie is the, uh, the 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 subject. I guess the, the protagonist of the story. So. And there will apparently be more than one. It's the rumored title, I guess, is genies plural. Yes. Wow. So that doesn't might mean. even be before humans exist. Who knows. It'll be interesting to well, see what they do with that. Today is Robin Williams, or it would have been Robin Williams' first thing. Yeah? Oh, wow. Maybe James Arnold Taylor can do a, a good Robin Williams impersonation. <laughs> I hope not. Like, we need, I mean, I don't know how silly you're trying to be. Oh, it's being silly. Okay. Like, <laughs> well, I know Robin Williams iconically did Genie, and I know that, you know, you had Genie in the animated series and Return of Jafar, not done by Robin Williams. And that kind of was still trying to keep true to the character. Yeah. But for a live action movie, um, I think you should just own the role and do it yourself and not try and emulate. Do you make him blue? Wings. Uh, sure, let's throw pop ups. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Purple. Well, see, for the Broadway show, they didn't make him blue. Yeah. So. No, don't make him blue. He'll look weird. Yeah, I think so too. Watchman style. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, last bit of news, uh, Ghostbusters, Dan Aykroyd confirmed to have a cameo. Uh, he will be playing a cab driver, and supposedly, he will say, I ain't afraid of no ghost. Oh, I didn't hear that, or read that. Sorry. Spoiler. So it goes along with the same thing that I, my dream storyline of what I have is. Uh, we have heard about that Dan Aykroyd was going to be a taxi driver, which that's confirmed, he confirmed it himself. Um... I, th- I think this fits. So this what, fits the storyline. So for people listening for the first time, what's your crazy theory? So my theory? crazy theory is the Ghostbusters, just like you and I in the present world, the Ghostbusters existed as a movie. 
this was what we grew up with, what we are, what we grew up watching. So the Ghostbusters are just a, uh, a, you know, something that existed in the television and movies. So now there's a couple of events that um, you know unfold where these four ladies or women who grew up watching the Ghostbusters. They get inspired, you know, some it, not, uh, supernatural events start happening, and their only reference to doing something is the Ghostbusters. So they try to imitate the go- what, the ghost- what they learned of the, out of the movies and implement it in real life. That's what I think is going to be the storyline, and where Dan Aykroyd and all these um, characters exist, but only exist as, oh yeah, we were the actors who did this. This wasn't real. So. What do you think about that, Edgar? I certainly hope that's not... <laughs> uh, I, I, I know you laid it out now, but that doesn't seem right to me that it's, a, it's just a movie. Because, I mean, the mayor's involved. The dude from the county department of health is in it. Oh, NYPD is in it. I mean, movie. That'd be, yeah. that'd be ridiculous. That would be like if Goosebumps made a movie that said that all the books were written and people read them, but the monsters were actually real. Like, this type of stuff doesn't get made. It's just pure nonsense. But keep in mind that the only reason this movie is getting made is because it was, uh, it was different. It did not rely on the original, on the original movies. No, I mean, so, so many people try to just say that, you know, like, you know, here's what happens 20 years later. These people went, I think, you know, Kevin Feig, no, not, yeah, Paul Feig. Paul Feig. Paul Feig, he went the route of, well, screw it, it exists, just like you and I grew up with. And I think that's why this movie's getting made, as compared to all the other crazy Ghostbusters ideas. To me, as a fan of Ghostbusters, that sounds great, to me. Maybe it takes place, too. What's that, Renan? Earth 2. Oh. <laughs> different universes. Ouch. And I, mean, I hope you're wrong. That doesn't sound pleasing to me at all. Um, but I'm not a fan of Ghostbusters. So, so, so we're going to watch the Ghostbusters movie about them watching the Ghostbusters movie? No. It's meta. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I imagine that this is just... Heavy, Doc. <laughs> I imagine this is just a continuation of like Ghostbusters 2. Where in that movie, they're at kids' parties. Nobody knows if it was actually real or if it was a hoax. So I think it's going to be like 30 years later. And, you know, it's everybody's forgotten about it. And it's just an urban myth. And they just kind of pick up the remnants. Or it's just a brand new story reboot. And he's just a, a nod. To he's just fact, a taxi driver. He's just a taxi driver. Yeah, that could be it too. But they'll, again, that will be a missed opportunity. Like to the, to the high degree of... G.I. Joe Transformers missed opportunity. Uh, moving on, uh, miscellaneous news. Uh, GQ did a photo shoot with Amy Schumer, uh, which was Star Wars, and she was in a lot of kind of risque like poses um, with. Dressed as Slave Leia. Dressed as Slave Leia. Um, topless. Topless. With C3PO, R2. Having a uh, after coitus cigarette. Um, there's a picture of her like deep throating a lightsaber dildo. Oh god! Um, yep. I forgot about that one. And there's all these photos, and then they came out, and I was like, I can't believe Disney allowed this to happen. Turns out they did not. Uh, <laughs> Disney went on record. Star Wars went on record on saying, Twitter, um, saying that these were uh, inappropriate, tasteless. And not approved photos with their characters, which GQ is not like a small thing. Like I'm surprised they just said fuck it and tossed the dice on angering Disney uh, in such in such a manner. Or maybe they don't care. It's publicity, and it's already out there, so it doesn't matter. I guess. Yeah, I was surprised by the use of the characters. It will be interesting to see what Disney does, if anything, at this point. Yeah. It was not endorsed by Star Wars, it was not endorsed by Disney, but it was endorsed by Mark Hamill himself. So, <laughs> that is a fact. Pervert. Um, but highly recommended. As, 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 a, as a Star Wars geek, this is great. I loved it. So, it's pretty. So, it's totally legal for her to do that. I just looked at it. Parody. 
It's a parody. C three PO and R two D two are characters. Like, can you? I mean, I guess they don't have logos. I mean, I guess right. this is the same thing as the stupid like. And I think parody, um, as we take it to its furthest degree, I think parody is a bullshit rule. Like when you have Justice League XXX, and it's like, oh, it's you know Superman sleeping with Wonder Woman, but he doesn't have the S shield, which is trademarked. It's bullshit. Like, DC did not sign off on that. You're not being clever. You're not being, like, unique. Not saying that's what... Not, not saying what Amy did here. Um, so I'm not trying to, like, draw that line or GQ did here. Um, but I am saying, like, parody is a quick shield that we allow people to hide behind. I... I agree, but... It'll be interesting if there's any... I mean, there's... I don't think that there's anything that anyone can do about it. So... No, but you're right. I mean, like, trademarks... So, I mean, like, R2-D2, C-3PO aren't trademarked. Um, yeah, the names yeah. might be trademarked, but, but the characters... You know, are. but, you know, I, I, I haven't studied the pictures, but I'm sure <laughs> they might have, if they're smart enough, maybe, you know, the trademark R2-D2 has a blue LED light. Right. right? They use a red LED light on this one. GQ did their homework. Somebody's got to. It's a huge publication. All right. Uh, new trailers that came out this week. Disney Pixar is the good dinosaur. I feel like we see a lot of animated movies that come out, um, and some of them are good. There's no, like, animation that I look at that's, like, bad. But the good dinosaur looks like it's really up there. They took the time. There's a lot of great effects of lighting and water. Um, the last, like, animated movie that I saw in, in theaters when I looked at it, like, How to Train Your Dragon 2, I was like, damn, they, like, raised the bar. Like, I thought they were making people faces before. Like, no, this is what yeah. it should be going forward. Um, I feel like Good Dinosaur is kind of like that. Like, just so much of the amount of detail in every scene is really great and vibrant. Have we had another year, Drew, or Pixar expert? Have we had one year where we get two Pixar movies? No, sir. This Never happened, right? So this is Pixar using their multitude of resources producing two movies at the same time. Uh, the Good Dinosaur has been under development for years I mean, and that's... years and years. It was initially going to be a 2D uh, movie. Um, so it was a story that was born within Disney Studios. And then when the merge happened, Pixar said, I like that story. Let me run with it. So this is a story that's been around for a while. Um, but like you said, Chris, it looks amazing. Great, you know, the characters, you know, again, th this is what, where Disney does their things. I mean, backgrounds and everything look so realistic, but their characters are definitely not realistic at all, which is, I, I think, what they do so well. As compared, you know, if you go back and listen to our podcast for Inside Out, that was one of the things I criticized, that the the uh, graphics or the animation just looked nothing new. It just looked very cartoony, very plain. This, uh, maybe that's where they put their resources. I don't know. Edgar? It looked amazing. It was like I was watching, like, to be tended in Yuma. Or something like the, the like the mountains, the mountain landscapes were beautiful. <laughs> it seemed like real life. As long as the dinosaurs doesn't talk, I'll be cool. I'm actually like I don't necessarily want the dinosaur to talk, but it does look like it's going to very much have like this non-verbal uh, discourse between the dinosaur and the boy for the most part, unless unless he starts like monologuing. Uh, I don't think that we're going to have like a lot of feedback. There doesn't seem to be a lot of characters to talk. And unless the dinosaurs speak to each other, which was not shown in the trailer whatsoever, this might be kind of a quiet, from a dialogue perspective, like movie. Wally. Like Wally, yeah. They can which pull is my out favorite movie. Pixar movie. They can pull it out. So they can definitely pull it off. Uh, I was actually trying to research. I mean, D Disney or Pixar has done very well with scores lately with Michael Giacchino. I wonder if he's doing it. I'm not 100%. Two dinosaur movies in one year? <laughs> uh, any other thoughts on Good Dinosaur? This exceeded my expectations, this trailer. Because all I've seen previous to this is the, uh, you know, the teaser. The teaser, yeah, which looked plain. The teaser looked plain. Yeah, it was at night. 
like with a fire and just like dinosaur just, jumping over some hills or something, you know. Mm-hmm. This was great. The music, oddly enough, is going to be I don't know. Michael Dana is the uh, music behind this, uh, known for Life of Pi. Capote, Little Miss Sunshine. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, so he's won one Oscar, so I guess not an unknown. Uh, he's got an Oscar under his belt. So, interesting. Uh, other show that came out this week was Attack on Titan. Um, Japanese production. Yeah, so Attack on Titan was an anime uh, that based off a of manga which now is going to have a live-action movie. We've seen this before with Death Note. Uh, so this is a Japanese studio. Two trailers uh, I, I saw. Um, I saw one, and I, was, I thought it was the only one. These guys pulled up a second one. So the Titans look great. Uh, the guy's moving in gears. Um, so if you don't know, like Attack on Titan is basically giant humanoid monsters eat people with reckless abandon. And uh, community like has a lead force that tries to fight them by using these crazy uh, gear movements that shoot out like wires that they've been like zip line around the city on and then try and slice their back of the necks. Motion looks great, combat looks great, everything else looks kind of cheesy soap opera y. Yeah, traditional Japanese fashion. <laughs> uh, I, again, you know, maybe. You know, be, have, speaking of foreign language, I, I appreciate the foreign films, but I feel like this kind of action movie and everything, the subtitles and the reading will just take me out of the action immediately. Like, I did not care at all for this trailer, at all. I'm not familiar with the anime, and I know a lot of the anime enthusiasts are definitely behind this production, uh, but I, to the normal consumer, I, I, I don't think this, this is really a hate. I really like it. I like the premise. Uh, I know that it's an anime. Uh, I, I wouldn't see it. I'm Redbox. I'm Redbox. <laughs> right? on Netflix. And who knows if it's going to get a wide release. Uh, I doubt it. So if it, if it comes here, it's gonna be like a one day thing. That's what they did with Death Note, the okay. live action Death Note when it when uh, it played in the United States. It, it's interesting. Something else that I watched this week, and I guess we'll kind of bridge into the next part of our podcast. What we've been watching. You've already said what you've been watching. Gosh, there's so much more. So something that surprised me this week in China, this movie, Chinese made movie called Monster Hunt. Um, Broke records of Chinese cinema for the top grossing weekend, fastest to whatever number, most number of tickets sold in one day. Um, and in the movie, the premise of the movie is basically humans coexisting with monsters, and the monsters start getting pissed off, and the humans go on a civil war against the monsters. Uh, the monsters are not like your typical looking monsters, the monsters look like like they, they were made out of a kids TV show so they're not intimidating at all like these things look like PBS made the uh, made the monsters it seems uh, like a family movie that's what they're going for um, but definitely weird again one of those movies that I just don't don't know if you saw it I watched the trailer because I was I was like man what if this is the hidden gem you know about about our you know about cinema but uh it, it, it wasn't. So if you guys hear about this stories, uh, Monster Hunt, good premise, good idea, but man, I, I guess lost in translation. All the monster look like cats. Like what? Cats. Cats. From Final Fantasy VII. From Final Fantasy. He was the giant Moogle. Moogle. He was an overweight Moogle with a cat on his head. I always pronounce That's it what Kate he... Sith. I did say it. Cat Sith? Oh. No, Kate Sith. C A I T. Anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah. What have you guys been watching? What have you been watching, Drew? Me? Yes. I saw Trinity <laughs> with Guillermo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feel like it. Yeah, it, was, um, it was pretty good. Not as laugh out loud as I was expecting. It was more of a, more of a chick flick. 
a surprise Definitely choice. Watch. Definitely watch. Is LeBron James going to be nominated for an Oscar? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> for an athlete that has no experience with acting before, no, he, he was really good. He, he was he, maybe the funniest. Oh, player. he's acting. What has he acted on? Oh. He's, he's flopped a few times. He's a flopper. Uh, no, yeah. but he, he he does very well with the, with the role that he was given. He plays himself. Yeah, I mean his character is LeBron James. Uh, yeah, so, he, I thought he was really good. Yeah, there's no highlights in this movie though, as far as the performance. Like because I thought, Hater doesn't really get to be funny. Yes, he's like the straight laced doctor, you know, who works for charity. So and he has like one or two lines where he's funny, but. The, 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 but his the, acting is fine. He's not like a bad actor. Yeah. He's just not 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 a funny character. It definitely, you know, I went in there thinking that this, even though it's a Judd Apatow directed movie, be this being Amy Schumer written movie, it felt like they, you know, when Amy Schumer had a script, she went to Judd Apatow and she said, you know, they they said, all right, let's put the Judd Apatow signature on the script because it definitely plays just like a Judd Apatow movie. Even though the script was none, he gets no credit for it. So it, it was an interesting take on that train wreck, but definitely worth a watch. Um, don't rush rush to the movies to see it, but definitely give it a you know give, it's it's a, it's a good date movie, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So you guys have a good date. Yeah, I'm true, and I always have good dates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you, Edgar? What have you been watching? I've been watching True Detective. Uh, it's only three episodes left. Wow. And I've actually started watching Ballers on HBO. Okay. Um, that was not bad. Like, I like football. I like watching football actions, I guess. Um, and I've also been watching a lot of Seinfeld. Like, a lot of Seinfeld. <laughs> Hulu. Does it hurt us? It, it, it's great when it's auto play. Like one episode to another episode to another episode. I love that. That's what I've been watching. Uh, something that Drew just kind of pointed at me. Something that we've been watching also is uh, comedians uh, in cars, get, getting, in cars getting coffee. The Jimmy oh, yeah, Sanders has six seasons of this, about ten episodes every season. And he has just random comedians. He picks them up in a car and they go drink coffee. I mean, that is the whole premise. But it's we so far. I've watched uh, Jim Carrey, Amy Schumer, uh, Jimmy Fallon, and I, I think those are the main three that I watched so far. The Jim Carrey one, excellent. It was definitely he's a strange man. He's a Jim strange Carrey. man, absolutely. But uh, it's an excellent. Jimmy Fallon was I like I thought Jimmy Fallon just looked like a cool guy to hang out with. All of those <laughs> he was, people. He was not not at all like he is on TV. You know. I think he's exactly like he is on TV. He's a, such a goofball, man. He was he wasn't goof around though. He kind of let Jerry Seinfeld do all the goofing, and he was just kind of laughing at Jerry because I mean Jerry's like a hero of his. Yeah. So he was he was kind of in awe of Jerry, and, and that's I guess he's even more humble. I guess. Yeah. I it it it, it definitely recommended to you that I, you know with Seinfeld. There's oh, one episode see. where uh, um, who, who's the guy who plays George Costanza? Who's the guy who plays George Jason Alexander. Alexander? Jason Alexander. The he picks up. One? Yeah, he picks up Jason Alexander, but it's not Jason Alexander. He puts it's on George. The, he puts on the George Constanza, <laughs> and he does the entire interview with, as George Constanza. And uh, yeah, Elaine, no, that was great. And, uh, Newman was in it. Yeah, Newman. Uh, yeah, uh, the Louis C.K. one is great because he shares a story about him on a boat. <laughs> um, also, the Larry David one. Yeah, that was like the first one, I think. One. Larry David was the first the first one he did. Yeah, and then Tina Fey's. Well, definitely uh, worth a watch. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say that I've been reading, I guess, you know, some of our roots for this podcast was based on the comic book world. Uh, but I picked up another comic book series, uh, the, uh, Detective Comics, uh, volume, I guess this will be volume 8, the beginning of volume 8, with issues 41 and 42. Uh, of the new 52 DC Comics. Um, the storyline is a Batman storyline where Batman has disappeared again, there's no Batman, and Commissioner Gordon puts on the suit. So that's the premise of this entire comic book right now. 
Um, Commissioner Gordon is the Batman. And uh, so far, so good. It's a very intriguing. Like, for that reason, that's how it was sold to me. And I'm like, I got to go get this comic book. Uh, so far, very good. Something that, <laughs> you know, at some point, if Gotham was anything good, <laughs> I guess, that's why, you know, it would be so good if at some point they set that up in that future where there is no Batman, but there's just somebody from the police force that dresses up as, you know, with the suit. So, that's it. What about you, Chris? What have you been doing? Uh, I saw the HBO mockumentary Seven Days in Hell. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was it was funny. Like I don't know if I like really like laughed, but I was entertained the full time I watched it. It was engaging. That's a good way to say it. it engaging. Was engaging. Uh, I definitely at the end of it felt like I would have liked my time back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple episodes of comedians in cars getting coffee. Yeah. Uh, so I can't recommend it, but it's whatever. Um, it, it's there if you have a morbid curiosity. Um. Surprise ending? Yeah, yeah, surprise ending. Yeah, that, that, that was... <laughs> one, I'm like... You know, that was one of those, like... No way they just did that... Uh, kind of moments with the ending. So, if anything intrigues you about... Definitely an ending. But now we told you there's a surprise, so you'll be looking for it. Which you'll still be surprised as crap, I think. Uh, lots of cameos. Uh, lots of... Ah, that's what the whole thing is. Fun, you know, fun cameos and fun characters. Um... Some of the better ones uh, is uh, uh, Howie Mandel. I, I love the character that Howie Mandel plays. Ah, I love like Copperfield. Copperfield is great. <laughs> Copperfield is great. But Howie oh Mandel God. acts... It, it's so different from, from Howie Mandel. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what else, Chris? How have you been doing? Uh, I started watching the CW The 100. It's okay. It's an interesting premise. Uh, it's, it is what it is. So, which is a stupid thing to say, but I mean, like, it, it's good for, like, a sci-fi teenage drama. What is it? I've never heard of it. So, Earth uh, is uh, eradicated through nuclear war, and then we're 100 years later in the future, where the last vestiges of humanity are on a space station that's oh, falling apart. I have seen So, they right drop um, 100... Uh, Inmates, which all happen to be like 18 to 14 year old children, because if you're over 18 and you commit a crime, they kill you. Uh, so they drop all their prison population on Earth to see like if it's okay, and then it is, and then it's them like reestablishing and like figuring it out. And I'm only a couple episodes in, so we'll see. Like, I don't know. I mean, that's the problem with so like this is like, running right now in the CW. It's running right now. I think season three starts. Season three, where has this show been? On CW. Wow. Uh, I think season three starts this fall. I'm watching season one on Netflix. So wow. I'm three episodes in. I missed it. I guess this went on the... Okay, yeah, it's not what I thought it was at all, actually. I, I think I'm thinking of some sci-fi... The 4400? I don't know. Where they all get powers? Is it in a spaceship? No, I don't know. Then that's not what I'm thinking oh, of. Oh, I know what you're thinking of. There's a new sci-fi yeah, series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're in a spaceship or something. That's what I thought you were, that's what I thought you were going, but... Uh. I forgot the name of that, but yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. And they're all, named, they're all numbers. Anyway. Uh, but also what we've all been watching, we all saw Ant-Man this weekend. Yes, topic of the week. Topic of the week. Uh, so just round table. Um, non-spoilers. Non-spoilers. Uh, Edgar, what are your thoughts on Ant-Man? I really like Michael Buck. I really like Paul Rudd. I didn't like Corey Stahl, the bad guy. Okay. Uh, I would give it... Um, B minus, not I. I mean, you, we've done enough of these reviews for you to know what rankings, man. Do you rush to the movies <laughs> to see it? Do you wait for it to come out on. Wait for it. Well, how far do we wait for it until it's on HBO? Do we. Until it's on TBS. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Well, I'm kidding. That's not B minus. Um, uh, go see it in the movie theater. Um, maybe in 2D. It, it wasn't shot in 3D. Did you see it in 3D? No. See, I don't think you it can wasn't see that. shot in 3D though. I saw it. In it was 3D. Close to What did you think? It was. I never, never blew me away. Okay, okay. I was never like, oh man. Are you ever blown away by 3D? Avatar. Hugo. After uh, the first five minutes? No. See. <laughs> 
I uh, always forget that I'm watching 3D after like five minutes. I didn't I see it in 3D. Yeah. If it's I, a good story. Yeah. I didn't see it in 3D, but a lot of reviews and everything that I've seen, is they said the, three, the 3D the three in this movie was great. I didn't think it was a visually good movie, so maybe the 3D does matter. Yes. Do you think it was visually impressive, Edgar? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it definitely it does matter. matter. What do you think, Drew? I mean, on that ranking, what do you put um, it? I'd give it a B as well. Um, I've honestly forgotten most of it. And a surprising, surprising lack of action for a Marvel movie. I think, I think there wasn't a lot of action, which, which, which leads me to believe maybe it's not one you really have to see in the theater. Because it's more of just a comedy to me. But, I mean, there is good action, there's just yeah. not a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Uh, I mean, if you're a Marvel fan, you've probably already seen this. Yeah. If not, you could probably wait, to be honest. Uh, for me, I agree with I agree with everything everybody said. But when I walked into the theater, I was just kind of like, that was an okay movie. But then, like, why was it just okay? I don't know. It was kind of funny. It did have visually impressive scenes. It did have a charismatic lead. Michael Douglas was a great actor and, like, stole most of the scenes. It had a good plot. And, I mean, like, I can be really nitpicky about stuff, and I will once we get into spoilers. But, like, for some some reason, even though all that it has stacked against, stacked for it, the end product was just all right for me. Like, I feel like I should like this movie more than I do, but it, it's really just kind of mediocre. It's kind of just middle of the road was my end up feeling but I don't know why I feel that way, because there are individual scenes that I enjoy, but it just didn't culminate into something great for whatever reason. We'll touch on this a little bit, and then I think it might have to do with the fact that maybe we're used to it, to, to, to the superhero ah, movies. I don't want to say that. I, I, that I might have a point, and we'll get into it, it I guess, really in the spoiler. Like a superhero movie to me, though. And that's, that's I guess, the yeah. other point to me is... Somebody that has no idea about what's going on in the Marvel Universe can definitely go and enjoy this movie. Uh, this movie, it's definitely a comic book okay, character. A in one scene, but we'll get to that later. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but as the main part of the movie, this movie plays fine. Um, I, you know, my first reaction, just with the opening scene of this movie, which we won't talk what it is until, you know, we'll give you a fair warning. My first thought after seeing that first scene, opening scene of this movie, was Marvel cannot miss. I mean, I, the movie could have ended for me right there, <laughs> and I would have been completely happy with it. I don't like the first scene. Yeah, we'll get on with that. We'll get on with that. Uh, very post production. Uh, I agree with that. The shoe in it. I agree with that. Well, you know, uh, I definitely, if, if you know, if you're an audience, go see it in the movie theaters. This movie. Just like any other Marvel movie, that serves to be watched on a big screen. Uh, it needs it too. It needs the lowest grossing opening weekend for a Marvel Studios film. True. Which this it, is not a chink in Marvel's armor. This is more reflective of Ant Man the character. Yeah. I think that they expected low box offices. Maybe not this low, uh, but this is not indicative of Captain America is going to fail and not cross a hundred. And this is not going to be the new tone. And I'm going to say that even after Fantastic Four bombs. Like, these are, these are iffy properties. Ant-Man would have made a lot more money if it would have been released in May, and Avengers would have been released in July. And if you're right. Maybe. 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 I mean, do his movies make a lot? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he... I don't think he... The, he wouldn't have attracted I think, another hundred million. Well, I mean, I think his vision... And his direction would have made this a lot more money because if you look at Guardians of the Galaxy, nobody knew shit about those comic characters, and uh, you know, just James Gunn had a really good vision, sure, and, and that played out really well. Yeah, but Peyton, uh, and, Peyton, and, and you're right, Reed. Is, Peyton Reed, Peyton Reed, he, he he does a fine job with this. Yeah, uh, at no point did I feel like, oh man, this guy has no idea what he was doing. He doesn't have quite as much of a signature as Edgar Wright, though. He's sure. But He's this is the guy. Comedies, this know. is the guy who brought us "Bring It On," and in every single one of the interviews that I watched uh, with him in it, some reporter would bring on "Bring It On," like <laughs> tell us about your experiences directing the cheerleading movie. Um, so, based on that, like he, I agree, the guy has no signature, but he can definitely direct a freaking big movie like this was. It could have gotten worse. 
It could have yeah, been. Yeah, no, it could have been. <laughs> the fact that he came in like last minute and, and pulled this off, this this final product, it is pretty impressive. I think it has one answer, Paul Rudd. That is the reason. So, um, I guess fair warning now. If you uh, don't want to continue listening, uh, hope to catch you next week uh, into our uh, podcast. And I guess, Chris, I'll let you sign off on the, the, this part, I guess. Like we usually do? Uh, sure. So full spoilers. We'll just see full spoilers now going forward. Um, I think the reason for me that I didn't like this movie uh, as much as I should have, like by no strength of imagination, am I saying this is a bad movie? Um, I think the characters were great. I think that I did like Paul Rudd's portrayal of, uh, you know, kind of the thief with a golden heart. And I did like him Pym as a uh, violent, um, you know, he wasn't like crazy, but like he did, you know, have some darkness in him. Uh, and I think they did a good job with that. And even, like, the Michael Pinna and, like, you know, like, the the quirky cast of characters. Yeah, that was great. Um, Michael Pena was fantastic. But where this movie failed me was relationships. So I think it had good characters. I think it had poor relationships. Hank Pym had three children in this movie. Uh, like, metaphorically. Yep. And none of those relationships were fucking established whatsoever. Except for the fact that they spoon-fed us and told us... I see myself in you. Oh, we're exactly... You chose him because you guys are exactly the same. You're my daughter and you hate me. Like, they didn't actually build anything. And even when, um, at the end, when you... And I know I'm bouncing around. And it's an origin story. And it's an origin story. You're right about that. And even in the end, when, like, Scott and Hope hook up, it comes out of fucking nowhere. Like, I know that they're male and female, but there was no chemistry there. It felt like... Friendship or I partnership. Think, I think there was a little bit of flirting, I guess, but yeah, I agree that it wasn't built very well. No, when they kiss, I was completely shocked. That I'm like, what? Where did that come from? So, so I think that's where the movie. I think that's why, like, I say the movie because it didn't feel right. It didn't feel like the scenes that we got were deserved. Like we didn't get build up and payoff. We just got okay. This is where the movie needs to be, and this is where the plot needs to be. So that's why I don't think that I enjoyed it as much as I think I should have. This felt to me very Iron Man 1, like, where the fact that they picked, you know, they had a good villain in concept, but I didn't really give a crap about the villain. movie? (laughs) (laughs) You're right. I mean, yes. Um, The villain, again, plays, builds up this master plan and gets defeated with nothing. The only villain anyone likes is Loki. Yeah, because he's made more than two movies. Yeah. <laughs> he's made a comeback and a redeem. Uh, but still, they're weak villains. I think this movie suffers exactly from that. A very weak villain. Um, so that's who what... Do it. Who doesn't... Yeah, I didn't care at, at all for this villain. Like, at the, you know, in the yeah. ending sequences where the big fight happens, I was just waiting, all right, when's this going to be over? Because, just like in the trailers, it felt like, yep, they're going to fight, and it's going to be, like, meaningless. Yeah, I mean, in the trailers, pretty much gave away that whole fight. Yeah. Uh, parts of the fight are the comedic moments. Which they overdo. Uh, but I will say, uh, uh, in that final fight, them fighting the suitcase was visually entertaining and great. Like, yes. seeing, like, and the not phone. spoiled in the trailer. Exactly, and then like even the the, thom- the, the, the Mentos and like all that, like yeah. that was like that was very well framed, and like it was just uh, I know, yeah. honey, I shrunk the kids. Yeah, just. that's what this reminded me of, especially with with him running with the ants. Yeah. Another um, great scene. Yeah, it was great. Uh, the ants, you know, great. Uh, that storyline is great. But let's talk about the, the, the uh, I guess the middle of the movie, um, or opening. We, all right, let's start opening sequence. I say that I loved it. So this is where they made a tie-in to the Avengers right off the bat. The, we see uh, Michael Douglas' characters of Hank Pym going to the S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, headquarters where Howard Stark and, uh, and uh, Peggy Carter are there along with this other guy uh, who escapes my... He's, he's, he's new to the movie. He, he resurfaces later on in the movie. Uh, but we see right off the bat the drift between Hank Pym and Howard Stark and the way that S.H.I.E.L.D. wants to do things and the way that the scientists wanted to do things. We see Michael Douglas look like an 80s Michael Douglas, which to me, seeing that, that was just amazing. It, it is so well done of how they make him look 
like a young Michael Douglas, and still not be over CGI. It was much better than Tron Legacy. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and much better than Terminator, uh, from what I've seen. Yeah, Terminator uh, Salvation. And Genesis. And Genesis has a big sequence of with seventies Arnold. So, um yeah. I feel like that opening was like a big like fuck you to Edgar Wright. <laughs> because that's like a microcosm of what Marvel did to him. He's he's Hank Pym. He's like, you can't take this movie. Let me retire. And then the whole movie, like, Marvel's uh, big, like, the serum that he makes. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. I think that opening scene was an Edgar Wright deal. No. He wrote it in there, yes. I feel like that part is similar to, like, G.I. Joe Retaliation, where you can tell where they added the that don't make any sense of I didn't like the first one. That's all. It sets up the movie, and it was great fan service to see Peggy Carter. It was maybe one of the only uh, character development scenes, as in, as in a character development for uh, Hank Pym. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you're right, and I think Peggy Carter being in there was distracting, like, just because it was like, hey, I love Peggy it. Carter. I love it. I, it was a surprise. I loved it, exactly for that reason. So, it was a surprise, you're absolutely right. Uh, let's talk about the middle uh, scene, and you guys know exactly which one it was. Uh, two weeks ago, I saw a TV spot for the for this movie, and this was one of the movies that I was staying away from anything since the last trailer. I'm like, I've seen enough. I don't want it. I'm done. You know, I have an idea of what this movie is going to be. Hopefully, it doesn't suck. Um, and in one TV spot, I was watching something, and I saw a glimpse of what I thought was the Falcon. I'm like, is that the Falcon in this movie? Wait a second, did I miss something? So I went in there thinking that. And of course, the middle scene, we, we see Ant-Man uh, visit the new Avengers facility, um, and he encounters the Falcon. So, one, why would Marvel release that as a TV spot? Like... What are you doing? That would have been... I mean, even though I kind of had my... It was a great scene for that, you know. It was a surprise to me. It was, I thought it was a great scene. I liked the fight sequence there. Yes. I thought it was... It was, pro, it was the best fight sequence in the movie. Yes. Agreed. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly that they did not need to show that. That, that, was, uh, uh, that would have been a great surprise, just like Peggy Carter. And... Falcon is not a big enough character to draw people into the movie, so it's not like, you, oh, they did it for marketing purposes. Yeah. Like, maybe if they dropped, like, Captain America or Thor in there, like, maybe they'd be like, oh, we'll sell an extra couple tickets. But, like, I don't think Falcon drives people to buy tickets. So they should have kept Nobody knows Falcon. They should have kept that under wraps. I agree. I agree. And they made it a huge deal that, you know, the Falcon's in it now. So, um, but it was great. And he won. Like, that's, that was almost surprising, like, that uh, Ant-Man beat Falcon. It's funny, with his first fight ever, he beats up an Avenger, and he makes mm-hmm. fun of that, like, he, he says that. No, he, I mean, he says, uh, oh, I survived, I survived a fight with an Avenger. Yeah. It's like, you didn't survive, like, you kicked his ass. Yeah, that, that was great. Um, toe-to-toe, man. It was that much was more so- interesting, like you said, it was the best fight scene in the movie. I think it's much more interesting to see, you know, a character that can shrink fighting someone who can't. Um, right. Like, and the final battle where both of them can shrink, you know. So I, I really liked that part, that aspect. Yeah, it was a, it was a good scene. I, I think my favorite scene of the whole. And movie. funny, it was really funny. Yes, it was my favorite scene of the whole entire movie. I think uh, steals the show, and I mean, it only sets up what this next Civil War chapter is going to be. We're going to see more of that interaction of Avenger with Avenger um, fighting each other. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be pretty interesting. Uh, that scene was great. Uh, the, I think I think the heist was great, like, when we see him using the ants and communicating, and he gets all the ants out of the server room and is, like, no ant left behind. Yeah. Which is so much the tone of these Marvel movies of, you know, cooperation and save everybody. Uh, and it, it was beautifully shot, and each scene was great. And then, like, quite frankly, the fact that at the end, like, he goes and he almost takes the suit, but then, like, uh, the villain who's... David Cross? Yes. Is that the actor or the no. villain? No, the character. The character. The character, yeah. Yeah. The last second's like, oh, I knew you were here the whole time. I'm like, what the fuck then? Yeah. Like, it's just so, like, whatever. Like, make better decisions uh, yeah. as a villain. Um, but 
it made for a good plot. And I get then, you know, that's the problem. Uh, there was but a, still great scenes. Like, there was, I mean, uh, you know, going back to fan service in these movies, tons of Easter eggs, uh, you know, splattered all over the movie kind of thing. Spread, they spread them out pretty, pretty evenly. And that's the one. Uh, something maybe you guys didn't catch. We see Hydra in this movie. Hydra comes back, you know, they're, they're the buyers, back. right? So that's pretty obvious. As part of Hydra, I don't know if you guys caught this, the tattoo on the, one of the Hydra guys is the tattoo of the, uh, seven, of the seven rings? Yeah, nine rings. The nine rings is the emblem for the, uh, the nine rings. It's one of the bodyguards that claims to be Hydra. So For Mandarin? For the Mandarin, right. I thought that was, that was pretty cool. I think like ten, ten rings? Yeah. From the Mandarin, yes. I really, I really think they're they're prepping the Mandarin like Come back. Avengers movie beyond Infinity War, you know, like that's gonna be one of their big villains. Why not? The real Mandarin. Well which I which we know it's probably gonna become Ben Kingsley. No. Yes, we saw that short. Remember that it's no, he, him make believe that was some guy sent to kill Ben Kingsley, sent by the real Mandarin. Because he's like he was pissed off that he was pretending to be him, and then all of a sudden he flips on, on that short. Nah, I don't think so. I think so. You wouldn't. Ben Kingsley was great because he was hilarious. He, he couldn't pull off a villain. Uh, what else do you think about Ant Man, Edgar? I really like comedy. Like when it was funny, it was funny. Yes. Uh, uh, let, Michael I, Pena. Yeah, I really like the Edgar Wright part of it. When the two people were talking, and like the one dude goes into a story, and goes into a whole bunch of different tangents, I felt like I was watching Scott Pilgrim versus the World, and that was cool. Uh, I also liked uh, the costume. The costume was really cool. Um, I also didn't. Um, wait, wait. Let me stick with what I like. Uh, I also liked. That Tony Stark, or that Howard Stark's like facility, became the the Avengers. That was funny. When uh when they fly over and they're like, oh shit, that's the Avengers, like <laughs> abort, abort. That was real funny. Um, what I didn't like, I would agree with Chris, are the relationships. Uh, none of them felt right. Like all of them felt off. Like the fiance was off. Uh, his wife was off. The, him and his daughter are kind of okay. Uh, like, like that whole uh, the cop as the fiance to his ex wife. Who was the know. husband? Wasn't it? I don't know. I, I guess they never explained that. Um, yeah, the cops again are useless in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Like, Why? Hey, Barksdale was one of the cops. Yeah, that's Is right. That Julius. <laughs> Julius. Yeah. He's Julius from uh, Remember the Titans. Um, yeah, so That's like I said, it. tons of Easter eggs throughout, throughout it. There's plenty of articles. I encourage all of you guys to go look into them. Uh, there's definitely good uh, parts of it. So, um, any other Easter eggs that you guys thought was, were cool? Uh, Easter eggs? I mean, they mentioned Spider Man. Yes. The oh, the first official mention of Spider Man. Wow. In a Marvel film. Um, I mean, Marvel Studios. I was just going to argue I'd like, to say official. I like that they, um, official. Like, like Paul Rudd is like, oh shit, we need to call the Avengers. Yeah. Like, that was really funny. Oh. And I like that it takes place after the Avengers, like it says. Uh, like in different newspapers, it's like, who's to blame for the or whatever. I don't know if you guys caught that. This is the first movie that's in the West Coast. I mean, that where the Iron fights, Man. where the West fights Coast. happen in the, the, Iron Man's in the, LA. the East Coast already. So we know the whole East Coast is under construction. Now this is post-Avengers time where they're in the West Coast. San Francisco, for that reason, not Los Angeles. Northwest. North, North, Northwest, right. So. Um, uh, suit was awesome. Buttons, shrinking, growing, yes. all that visually impressive. First time he shrinks. Every time he shrinks, it's, it's great. Um, and again, like, and I know it's silly, but like when, um, I can't remember his name, but when Michael uh, Penny's character rescues the guard, when he's like, oh shit, I forgot about the guard. Oh, yeah. Like, that's just very much like, we're not bad guys, we're just doing bad things. How much is, how, how cool was that scene where he, you know, the whistling? 
<laughs> no whistling. <laughs> and the one thing that he decides to whistle, it's it's a small world. Oh, like this that is was so ham fist. That was so Disney, Disney. man. Uh, it's that Disney was, and it's about a shrinking man, so. I know. I, was, I liked that. Um, Again, um, one of those, it, that was also in a TV spot. Um, like, there's a whole TV spot about that scene and him... Oh, I saw that, but they didn't reveal the actual whistle. They just they they showed did. a conversation. No, they do at the end of the, the no, whole TV they spot. Didn't. They didn't. I, I watched, watched it with it. you. I watched it with you. And they whistle. Like, he whistles that. He doesn't whistle. Yes. Uh, I, I feel like you guys don't watch the same thing. Because <laughs> <laughs> Drew is like, no, that's a real Mandarin. And then Memo's like, no, that's a big Mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys need to watch it. Uh, 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 oh, something else that I just remembered that I like is when he shrank and then he went into like the atomic zone. That looked so cool. That was cool, like a nice old like 2001 Space Odyssey. That was cool. I did like that, which is funny because I hated the abstract thought from Inside Out, but I did like <laughs> like watching him go into the the quantum what yeah. they call the quantum zone here, yeah. Cool. Which in the comics is called. This, the microverse, the microverse, which in Civil War it's going to be a big deal, and I think that's oh yeah, that's right. They have a prison there. Yep. And the, yeah, and then uh, huh? it's Is that where they don't play worry about it. Winter Soldier. No. Oh. Yeah. So the last scene. Let's talk about that last scene. Uh, where the fuck did they come up? Like God, they fucking rushed that. Like that was a disappointing last stinger. Really? Because I mean, like, and I know we had the, I know we had like. I think it's the most confusing one. So we have Winter Soldier, and they're like, we have a mission to do. And then Avengers Age of Ultron, we're still looking into it. End of Ant-Man. Hey, we found him. He's just kind of hanging out. Looks like his arm maybe clamped to some random he machine. Clamp. Yeah, he's, he's on, a, on a, some kind of clamp, yeah. So what are we going to do with him? Well, the first thing that they do is we're not going to tell Tony about this because they've been, you know, the whatever delegates or whatever they, they, they call so apparently there's already a governing the body. The, the what was it? What the, the accords. The accords, right? Let's not tell the accords because of the government. So right off the bat, we're setting up civil war. We're not telling Tony about this. And I think they they make the reference to and something that was confusing was, you know, uh, Falcon says, "I know a guy." Oh, that's Ant Man. But why? Why Ant Man? Because Technology. he thinks he can shrink. Because yeah, cause because he can hide him. Or something like I don't know. Maybe because like Tony doesn't know that guy. the Ant-Man exists yet. Yeah, maybe. Because I mean, you see, because you see Scott messing with like electronics and shit. He's an so. MIT master's in electrical engineer. Uh, which was you know, holy crap! Everyone went to MIT. That's an Avenger, apparently. <laughs> yeah, if you're smart, you went to MIT. So uh, great play on that. All right. Um, well, that's what we thought of Ant-Man. Let us know what you thought. Uh, you can hit us up at Twitter. Um, I'm NerdyXP. You can follow Drew. Mm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you can follow Guillermo at that guy in line. Indeed. Um, if you want to hear uh, more thoughts on movies, games, reviews, features, check out NerdyXP. Uh, I do another podcast on Thursdays, video game focused, NerdyXP Gamecast. And then Drew also does a horror movie podcast called Straight Chillin'. Chilling. Chilling. With a G. <laughs> if you just search Straight Chillin', you'll still find it. <laughs> Probably. Um, both ways. If you like this episode, please like this episode. Uh, give us a five-star review. Um, you don't need to write anything. Just give five stars. That's fine. That's all anybody cares about. <laughs> it helps the show with searchability, finding, and kind of traction. Um, that's it. Thank you, Drew. You're welcome. Thank you, Edgar. Anytime. Thank you, Memo. You got it. And thank you out there for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this week's episode and that we were able to help you with your movie IQ. Level up, friends.